Additionally, um, I have, a, and in case we have a lull in conversation, I have a few questions um, to get us started. And just give me a second because I want, I'm hoping that it's possible for me to have my notes while I project my screen to you on Zoom. So bear with me for one moment, please. Um, I haven't tried this feature yet. Um, oh, um, could you enable share screen, uh, screen sharing for me? Uh, sure. If I can do that. Uh, let's see. Does that, see if that works. Okay. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. I thought I did that um, already. Oh, no problem. Excellent. The, um, the feature that I saw on a video, on an instructional video today, exists. So I'm thrilled. <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. So can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Are you seeing something that says ageism and the implications of aging into a stereotype? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Oh, all right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for um, this opportunity to speak with you about um, age stereotypes, ageism, and self perceptions of aging. Um, yeah, I'm just absolutely thrilled by this opportunity, and I'm really excited about the um, the diverse the age diversity in the audience today. And it's just a real treat for me to be able to uh, present with you just I I guess some of my ideas and also a little bit of my research um, to you today. Um, all right, so we'll get started. Um, Okay, so before we begin, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. So um, I am an Oregonian. I, my undergraduate is in anthropology and I came I, where I studied at the University of Puget Sound. Um, and then I received my master's and my PhD in um, human development and family sciences at, the, at Oregon State University. And then I went over to Michigan for a postdoc where I worked on the health and retirement study and also in the biopsychosocial um, aging collaborative. And then that led me here to the University of Illinois. And I've been at Illinois since um, fall of 2017. So this is the beginning of my fourth year. Um, but so this seems like a really linear journey, but I actually, there's a special part of this uh, trajectory that I wanted to point out. And that's that right here, I spent seven years working in long-term care in um, program development. So I did things like develop the activities program um, at a long-term care facility, and then also help with uh, developing technologies to support our, our um, older adults to age in place. And so that was just a really formative time for me. Um, anyway, so it's just something that I wanted to share with you. All right, so um, here is how I was thinking about structuring the talk today. Um, basically, what I want to do is take a start, take a really broad view, like think about society and just reflect on how the society that we live in is actually age structured and what that means for us. And then what I'd like to do is talk about images about aging and stereotypes that we form or that are delivered to us about age and aging. And then we'll move on to talk about the process of how we come to embody those stereotypes of aging that we live with. And then um, we will discuss beliefs about our own aging. And then I'll touch on a few empirical findings. All right, so first I'd like to begin with the statement that we live in an age structured society. So chronological age moves us through socially defined stages of the life course. Um, this age structure is most evident at the two ends of the lifespan. So what I mean is that whether we're ready or not, we're able, we're legally able to drive at age 16 and whether or not we feel like an adult, we become one at age 18. 
And at 21, by some magic, we're suddenly deemed old enough and developed enough to purchase alcohol on our own. And so, and then on the other end of the lifespan, chronological age qualifies us for Medicare and Social Security benefits. Um, chronological age essentially defines our status as a young child, as an adult, as an older adult. And it also provides a reference point as we move through institutions of education, of work, of becoming a parent, a parent, and retirement. And so to illustrate this point, consider these terms that you may have heard of. Consider the term an untraditional student or the term advanced maternal age or an idea like someone who's a late bloomer or going into early retirement. All of these are sayings that are familiar to us because they're based on expectations about chronological age and how old a person should be during these certain life transitions. And so some argue that as a result of our age structured society, our lives actually become quite age segregated. And so what this means is that many older adults do not necessarily have an opportunity to befriend a younger person outside of their own family. And similarly, younger people do not, is, do not naturally or easily have opportunities to befriend older people. So like, so yes, these friendships occur, but they're not something that occur as a function of a natural structure that we have in our society. And so to illustrate this point in this slide, I just did a quick uh, Google image and this image repository called Unsplash. And I just searched for these terms of student, employee, parenthood, and retirement. And you can see these age norms, right? So in this image of a student, you see all younger people. The image of an employee is an adult, maybe middle-aged adult. Parenthood, even though parenthood, you're a parent across your lifespan, you're a parent as in old age, as much as you are in young age, right? But with the image of a parent is someone who's in more a younger adulthood or adulthood. And then retirement has its own, you know, images of an older couple usually, and it, it usually involves a beach. Anyways, um, moving, moving forward. So although younger people would not necessarily meet older people without making some effort to reach out, we are all aging. Even younger people are aging. And so because of this, we develop our own images of aging. And these images come from our interactions with older people whom we've met and our experiences watching our loved ones age but also they largely come from cultural representations of age. And I guess what I would like to do is assert that due to age segregation, it's the images of aging from the media that they, that they play a strong role in shaping our expectations and, the, and our images of what aging means. And so if you search the internet for key terms that we value, key terms that are important to us and meaningful for people of all ages across the lifespan, we see that many of these values are actually associated with youth. And so what I did with this slide is once again, I went to Unsplash and I searched for these words like active, successful, beautiful, mentor, skilled and strong. And all of these images involved young people. None of them involved older people. And so when we hear sentiments like we live in an ageist society, this is generally what scholars are referring to, that at a cultural level, we value youth. Um, so the dominant images of the qualities that we value and strive for do not represent the role that age and aging plays in fulfilling and meeting these ideals. For example, Bernice Newgarten wrote that a marker of middle age is moving from being socialized to being the socializer, meaning essentially from being a mentee to becoming a mentor. And additionally, ideas like skill and success, these are products of experience, of trial and of tribulation. And experience is something that occurs 
through the course of elapsed time. In other words, experience is a happy byproduct of being fortunate enough to have lived for many years and to experience old age. And so it's not that a younger person can't be a mentor or a younger person can't be skilled. It's just that these images do not represent a key component of the meaning of these words. And so to be fair, I also searched for the word senior in Unsplash. And honestly, I was really pleased with these images that arrived, that, that came up. I thought that these were very positive images of men and women engaging in meaningful tasks. Um, and I am quite impressed with these images. If you, if you do a Google image search, for example, of just the word senior, it conjures images of a laughing group of older adults or a couple walking on the beach or an older adult looking into the eyes of their carer. And these are nice images, but it's, it was nice to see on this unsplash uh, place to see a more diverse picture. But I wonder why wasn't an, an image of an older adult provided when I looked for these words for success, especially for mentor or for skilled, even the word wise. I searched for the word wise and I almost didn't because I thought, oh, it's going to show a really, you know, it's going to show an image like this of a wise person and um, the dominant image was an owl. So um, anyways, that was interesting to me. But I mean, when you look at these images, especially for the one of the man with the newspaper, like to me, that very much looks like success. And similar, similarly, the older adult with the iPhone, that could very much be skilled or the woman in the kitchen, that could be skilled, right? But these images came up for the word senior and not skilled, anyhow. So, now on to ageism. So ageism is the false belief that individual worth can be defined by age. And so when we think about ageism, we should think of it, of it at two levels. There's ageism at the societal level. So that's a dominant cultural bias toward youth. <clears throat> and then there's ageism at the individual level. And this is when an individual makes an assumption about an, individu an individual's worth, about their ability or their capacity based on age. And I would like to note, and it's important to point out that age is a protected social status. An employer, an educator, um, a business person is not allowed to discriminate, from an, discriminate on the basis of age, right? It's a protected status. So what we're talking about is more subtle. This isn't because otherwise, um, no, sorry, take a step back. So yes, age discrimination happens and one could press legal charges. If you felt that you lost your employment due to your age, you could, um, you could press, you could go to the court, courts for that. Um, but what I'm talking about here is more the ageism that we experience in daily life, essentially encountering somebody who uh, has just very stereotypical beliefs of, of, in, of an individual's worth, you know, based on of someone who is judging the worth of an, of an individual based on their age alone. Anyways, going back to ageism at the individual level, if an individual is making an assumption about an individual's worth, ability, or capacity based on age, Remember that age is a protected status and that we do not necessarily walk around with our actual chronological age on our head, right? So that means that age is, ac is actually often assumed rather than known, right? So people, it's, it's based on characteristics that people see or by actions that an individual might assume one's age. And you can see this both in terms of people be appearing older, but also younger adults who are trying to progress in their career feel that or have reported that they look forward to, you know, getting the wrinkles near their eyes as it establishes some level of credibility in their business interactions, you know, it denotes some level of experience. Um, and then, so, so age discrimination is a specific act of denying someone an opportunity based on that person's age. And age discrimination is also the 
experience of being denied an opportunity based on one's age. And age discrimination is against the law. We are not allowed to discriminate based on age. And note that the discriminator may not be conscious of their act is an, another important caveat. So as a result of living in an age, so we've gone from discrimination and I just wanted to define that term. And so these ideas of, of discrimination is essentially making a broad assumption, right? A broad assumption, another way to think about that is just people holding and maintaining stereotypes. And so stereotypes essentially are formed as a result of living in an age structured society in a society where we have few opportunities to interact with individuals of diverse ages and in a society that has a strong bias toward youth, we encounter stereotypes about aging at work and in the healthcare system and in our, in our interactions with others. Additionally, because our understanding of aging is founded largely by watching those before us grow old, our stereotypes about aging often lag behind the reality of aging. And so this chart is from a table in this chapter by uh, Stoudinger from 2015. And, and, and it's very clever. They list these common old age myths and then summarize essentially the evidence for those myths, right? And so these are common old age stereotypes that actually aren't true. You know, stereotypes such as most older people feeling sick, most blood parameters changing with AIDS, depre age, depression being more likely in age, um, older adults primarily living in the past, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the thing is, is that, so these are stereotypes about aging that really exist at the societal level and we encounter them in our daily lives. And so as we navigate our lives within an age structured society, we develop these general beliefs about aging and general beliefs about older adults. We may, for example, come to think of aging as a loss. We might think that aging is a process, age, that the disability that comes with aging is, that is correlated with aging is inevitable and that no matter what we do with age comes sickness, aches and pains. Or we might see, come to think of age and aging as an opportunity to enjoy the fruits of our labor, to become a leader and to give to others. And you see these beliefs that we have about our own, about aging in general, they color our interactions with others. And they also are the basis of the assumptions that we make about older people in general or an older person whom we're interacting with. But the unique thing about age stereotypes compared to stereotypes that we may hold for other groups of people is that if we're fortunate enough to grow old, we will actually become a member of the group that we once held stereotypes about. And what's really fascinating is that research shows consistently that these stereotypes that we become, that we hold of other, about others actually become stereotypes against ourselves, against our own aging. And so in other words, these beliefs about aging in general become beliefs about our own aging. And so these beliefs about our own aging are thought to be triggered when we become when, by an awareness of age related change. So imagine a moment when you experienced a change that you attributed to age. And for example, let's consider a pianist who due to progressive arthritis can no longer play the piano. So on the one hand, this individual could focus on the loss that this individual can no longer play the piano that they once did. Or on the other hand, in spite of this age related change, this individual could see the opportunities to master other interests or to find new ways to express themselves or to be perhaps become a piano teacher. And so, um, and so it, tur and it turns out that how we think about our own aging has significant consequences for our future experiences of aging 
including health, health behaviors, and longevity, and it unfolds like this. So research has shown that those with more positive beliefs about their own aging are also more likely to engage healthful behaviors across their lifespans, and especially in older adulthood. Additionally, those with more positive views about aging are more likely to seek out medical care when they experience a condition. In contrast, those with more negative views about aging, those who feel that disability is inevitable with age, they are also less likely to engage in healthful behaviors and less likely to seek medical preventative care from their doctors. Additionally, those with more negative views about aging are also more reactive to stressors that they face in daily life. They might be more perceptive and reactive to microaggressions that they encounter. And as these behaviors and as these reactions to stress unfold over days, over weeks, months, years, and decades, these beliefs about aging also predict the number of functional limitations that individuals experience in old age and also how long they live. And these effects are over and above, you know, every other statistical control, like any marker of socioeconomic status, so income, education, wealth, um, health conditions, et cetera, et cetera. It's really a profound and strong uh, finding that persists. <laughs> Um, and so additionally, in some of my research, we found that individual beliefs about aging are actually shared. So I've used some nationally representative data to look at husbands and wives shared beliefs about aging. And I found that 30% of their individual beliefs about their own aging, they actually hold in common with their spouse. And, and I found that these shared beliefs about their aging have implication for future health over and above individual beliefs about aging, their individual health behaviors, et cetera. So, this, the, so what I mean is that, close, that in close relationships, indi individuals are co-constructing beliefs about aging and that these shared beliefs have their own unique implications for health in the future. And so an open question is whether communities would also co-construct shared beliefs about aging and what the implications of these shared beliefs could be for individual health. And so although I do not know of an empirical example that looked at, you know, a small community, however, I do know that research has shown that culture informs beliefs about aging. So you would imagine that to the extent that a community has a distinct culture, you know, a distinct set of shared meanings, that part of that would be about beliefs about aging, with regards to beliefs about aging. I've also done a little bit of research on the implications of uh, age discrimination. And so this is the final empirical study that I wanted to share with you. My colleagues and I used a nationally representative longitudinal a sample of data to examine the effects of age discrimination on preventative health behaviors. And our hypothesis was that age discrimination would affect future health behaviors through their impact on beliefs about aging. And so essentially in 2008, we had data on whether or not the individual reported an experience of age discrimination. And um, we found that those who experienced age discrimination had fewer positive beliefs about aging in 2012. And so what I'd like to point out here is that in this study, we, did, we thought of beliefs about aging not as on two scales. We imagined that people could hold both negative views about aging, that a negative view being that you know, with age comes, you know, that with age comes loss, uh, along with positive beliefs about aging and that with age, I'm able to do the things that I like. And that those two ideas aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, that an individual can hold both. And so what we found was that the experience of age discrimination did not have an effect on negative beliefs about aging, but it decreased positive beliefs about aging. And this to me was just, I, I remember I just thinking about it, my heart still aches, right? But it, 
it was really a striking finding to me that 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 the pathway that it takes is by taking it takes away what people maintain as positive about aging and to me that's just really tragic anyhow as a result of positive of fewer positive beliefs about aging in 2016, those individuals also had fewer preventative behaviors, preventative health behaviors. Um, interestingly, we did not see a direct link between ex the experience of age discrimination and future preventative health behaviors. The, uh, the pathway went through the, the, the effect on self perceptions of aging. And um, anyways, so that is, um, a, a finding from 2019. And so I guess as I close up, um, I just wanted to talk to you about moving forward and how we should think about addressing ageism. And I think that because ageism is very much societal, in addition to a product of our individual acts, it's really important to think at both levels, right? And so at the societal level, I think that we should advocate, you know, for how, for how we're you know, the cultural images of aging that we're creating and what it means to age. And I think that we should also advocate for um, divert experiences that, that span multiple age groups to increase the diversity of age in our interactions. Um, and I think that there are a few trends that are making this more likely perhaps for example, um, as people are living healthily longer and staying in the workforce longer, it also means that there's more age diversity in the workspace, right? And so that means that people have more opportunities to interact with people at different ages, you know, over a period of time. And similarly, because our economy is becoming more complex, it's not uncommon for people to return to education later on in life. And so that means that universities are also becoming more age diverse, which means that students, although it's still mostly, you know, younger adults, have more opportunities to interact with people of different ages. And so I think that this is really positive. I am, the research has shown that, you know, with more interaction across groups also comes more understanding. And so I think that at the societal level, this could do have a lot of benefit. And I think that at the individual level, it's really important for us to think about how beliefs about aging shape our interactions with others. And um, the first thing is something that, that my mom always told me is that the only thing that you can change is yourself, right? And so I think that there's a really empowering message here. Like we, yes, culture shapes our beliefs, but they are our beliefs, right? And they are something that we can change. And I think that, um, if we, that, that if we can strive to see the good in aging, to see the good that, that also accompanies the loss, that, that it will benefit our own well-being, but it will also um, mean that we will see that in others, that we, we will, that we will bring that to our interactions with others as well. And, um, and I also think that, um, also, if we interpret, if we experience um, a moment where someone, where we feel that someone is making a generalization about us or about our ability based on our age alone, you know, I hope that my talk can give you a little bit of compassion for that individual. Because the research suggests that, that their thoughts, that their, their negative general thoughts are coming from stereotypes, you know, that, and that they probably have a negative view about their own age. Aging. And so you can, you know, yes, that person can, you may have hurt you, but, you know, you can just feel, you can feel for that person, I guess, you know, because it's, you know, it, it just reflects that, that they're also not, com that they're likely to not be comfortable with their own aging as well. Anyhow, so um, that concludes my talk. I would like to thank you guys for uh, the opportunity, and now we can open the questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. So yes, um, so as we mentioned, if you have questions, go ahead and, oh, we got one. Oh, thank you, Shannon. Um, if you have questions and you'd like to 
um, ask them. We have an audience here too, <laughs> Shannon. You can't see them here, but um, does anyone in the audience here have questions? And if so, I can bring the microphone to you. No questions? Oh, hold on. I got one. One second. Hey. <laughs> we think you mentioned the issue of older people struggling with technology. I think you mentioned iPhones or something. Did I understand that uh, as an issue that can or should be dealt with? Because I have a question about that, but I wasn't sure if I understood. I think you made some reference to iPhone. Oh, could you repeat the question, please? I can speak a little bit to older adults and technology, but I couldn't quite hear the question. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes. Um, well. My question was, if I understood that you were raising the issue of technology for older people when you, I think you referred to iPhones at one point in uh, talking about the stereotypes or something. Maybe it was already in my head and I thought you said it. But, uh, oh, yeah, thank you. So, right, so I brought up that image of the older adult using the iPhone because to me it represented a moment, an, an element of, you know, some level of skill and adaptability. Um, and so I thought that it was really positive that when I searched for the image senior that such an image came up, right, of an individual engaging with, a, of an older person engaging with modern technology because one would, because it is a stereotype that a negative stereotype about older adults that you know they don't want to learn new things or something like that. So I thought that it was very positive that just good, that searching for the word senior created this uh, positive view of a positive image of aging. Well, well, I have my own experience of struggling with this because you know I've been fairly technically knowledgeable or able through my life, but I've never really gotten into the most recent digital technology. And my self-assessment is that my problem is I don't seem to have patience to work through something new. You know, um, I, I, I find it difficult to learn new things because when I don't do it quickly, then I get impatient with myself and don't allow myself to go through the learning process in a sense. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's, and that's true. And it's um, because with, with age, we maintain our, our crystal intelligence, our, 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 like our, our basic building of knowledge of culture and society and, you know, our social knowledge, essentially, but our processing, our, 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 our processing speed, uh, it decreases a little a bit with age, right? And so learning new things is, is possible, but it is technique, it is more difficult just because of changes with age related changes in the brain. Um, but so you should be patient. So a tip might be to create um, some, a goal that you're working toward. So the older adults that I know who became facile with new technologies really had something that they were trying to accomplish. For example, they wanted they wanted to be able to take to use the phone to take the pictures, or they let, there was something about the phone that added value to their life, and then that created the motivation for working through the um, the parts of learning that are less comfortable at all ages. You know, <laughs> but but essentially, like so, if you create a goal or a real reason to want to do something, then it might be a, you might find that you have more patience for yourself. Does that help? Yes, he said that helps. <laughs> awesome, cool. All right. Are there any <laughs> other questions in the audience here? We've got ten people here, and Sarah, can yeah. I? Can I? Oh, hear sure. You? Oh, yeah, okay. definitely. Shannon, thank you so much. I don't. It's not a question so much, but just an observation. Having started um, in this field. Uh, most definitively in the young category of 23 years old and now um, firmly into middle age. <laughs> I guess I would just say that um, we oftentimes think about the, 
the struggle we're having with our whatever age we are is a sort of unique to our group but you know when i when i hear the concerns about learning technology as a 80 year old or 90 year old um it's true that i might learn it faster than the 90 year old but i can assure you that my 20 year old learns it faster than i do and so it is, it is a spectrum, and I think when we start to value people for people and not um, try to limit their capabilities on any sort of stereotype, we, we do develop that empathy where we recognize that, that while it might take um, an 80-year-old longer to learn the technology, all that they bring to that uh, other aspects of life way, uh, outvalue that extra time, and so... Um, I, I would just say that it is a cause worth fighting for because people have stereotypes against me as a 48 year old woman that um, don't hold water and and I don't want um, I don't want society limiting what I can do based on their perception of my age and, and I doubt I'll be any less tolerant more tolerant of it when I'm 85 years old so those are my comments. Absolutely. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, yeah, I, oh, are there? Uh, one more. Hold on one yeah. moment. Okay, I'll try and talk a little louder. Are you getting it? Okay, um, this is not a question, but a comment. And something that I really don't appreciate is when we try and talk about how it feels to be old or getting old. And somebody says, well, we're all getting old, even a baby is getting old every day. That is really not helpful to me. Um, and I see two problems that are more confined to the older person. And that is, uh, one is the uh, loss of mobility, and the other that is really difficult to deal with is losing your friends. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, how do we yeah. Thank you so much for those points. I think that, you know, I, it's really, hold on, there's so much that I want to say. You're absolutely right. Like aging, yes, it happens across the lifespan and we're all aging, but aging as it's experienced in older age is, is hard, you know, and it's something that I, that I won't understand in its full nature until it's, until I'm, until we're in it, you know, and I think that, uh, I think that that's really important. And I think that, um, that we would be that it's that it's an untruth to say that aging does not have negatives right like as much as yes it's healthy to you know we should look for the positive in aging it is not realistic to ignore the negative and and it would be and it's not and we need to especially ignore i mean acknowledge and and mourn for the losses that that come with age both in our ability and you know not being able to do activities that we love in the same way that we used to be able to do them um and also you're absolutely right and losing our friends like there's nothing easy about that and so um anyways thank you for those comments and i apologize if um yeah i don't know i think that it's something that scholars in my field that we really struggle with because there, you know, for, for all of the last century, um, only the negative was seen about aging and there were just all these negative stereotypes. And so a lot of emphasis was done to say, look, there's diversity, you know, and there's, and there's, for, there's losses, but there are also gains, right? And, um, and there's a lot of strength that people have in dealing with those losses. But I think that the main trouble is, is that we try to almost make it in dealing with age, become ageless, you know, strive for age to be ageless, but age is still there, right? And I think um, I'm not as, I'm not a scholar in, you know, in racial or group dynamics and those types of dynamics, but 
I think that it's a similar, it, there's a parallel, you know, to like individuals might try to be colorblind, right? But color is there. It's, it's part of the human experience. It's part of these individuals experience and very much age is there, right? And so we're not asking for people to ignore age. What we're asking for is to not assume something about somebody based on their age. And similarly, like if I, if someone is mobility limited to just to not make even an, to make an, not make an assumption about that, about what that person can contribute, you know what I mean? And so, and so that's, that's the challenge, right? Is to just go beyond those assumptions so that we can encourage people, you know, to their fullest ability to, so that people can live the lives, you know, to the greatest ability that they want to live. Anyways, thank you so much for that comment. Thank you. Oh, one more, hold on. About uh, 20 years ago, my mother was diagnosed at the age of 82 with ALS. And uh, that's, you know, muscle deterioration. And in her case, she never lost her ability to walk. Her hands were the first to go. And then she had difficult speaking uh, well. And it was so sad because many of her friends made no attempt to understand what her disease was. And also, themselves away from her and mm -hmm. they can stop visiting her. I think they thought she had a cold or something. And that, my mother said that was so hurtful that people didn't try to find out what her abilities were and what she was able to do because she missed her friends who just stopped visiting her, her in town friends. And then the second thing that was so hard for her near the very end of her life when she was getting the pneumonia so easily. Uh, about the last month, she was in a nursing home. And uh, one of the therapists came and was going to make a sort index card for her with words on them. So that the, uh, I think it was an occupational therapist thought that she could flip those cards you know, when she couldn't make herself understood, she would put those cards around to communicate with people. The problem with it is her hands were not, you know, flexible. You know, so I was actually there the day the therapist came and was helping her with the index card. And my mother kept explaining to her, you know, why this wasn't going to work. And I didn't really think it was my role, maybe it was, to explain this to the line. But my mother and I just kept making eye contact and saying, oh, what are we going to do with this? So those are just a couple of pointers on an older person with a particular disease. I, that, thank you for that comment. I heard, I think that I have the gist about it and that, because it was a little difficult to hear, but what I, what I caught, and so, we add on to this if there's more key elements that uh, you would like to be incorporated into this discussion. But um, is that what's, is that really our friends and family, and especially our friends, don't need tools to deal with people's changing conditions, right? I mean, at least that's what I see as the take home message. Like it's, a, and it's, a, it's an established phenomenon. It's your experience the experience that you've had with your mother is, 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 is not a single experience. It has been documented in the literature that, um, that, in, that is when people move in, when their abilities decrease, that oftentimes their, their friends don't know how to interact, don't know as much how to interact with them anymore, and then they they don't they, they they don't socialize with them as much and i think that um in a supported environment what would be helpful is to give people the tools 
of like, you know, like, it, I don't know. I mean, we can have what would make something easier, right? Is it, would it be helpful to have a conversation about, would it be helpful if we could talk about ability, if we could talk about changes in ability or changes in need or changes in desire, and we could be more open and frank about that? I don't know if to me, maybe that it seems like something that could be helpful that um, it, it, one would think that the, the why are friends not going to see their friends anymore, you know, and some of the research suggests that it's, it, it's ageism, but it's more of a, a fear of aging, I think is more appropriate. And also just not knowing, not having the language or the tools or not knowing how to talk to someone when they're at that, that when they're experiencing that loss, right? And so people who have, have some friends who can take that journey with them and, and then there's other friends who don't have the tools to take that journey. And so, you know, maybe it makes sense to support just to, if, especially in a community like yours where you have support, maybe developing a language, you know, or the tools to, to help friends navigate these changes that their friends are experiencing could be really helpful, right? But I mean, that's a discussion that a community would have to have because on the other hand, maybe the culture of a community would prefer that everyone is really private and that you don't have discussions like that, right? So I think, I don't know, I, I really, I really, really appreciate uh, that point. And, um, and the facility that I worked in when I was in my 20s, it was, we, it was an aging, uh, we had people of multiple abilities and we strived for them to not move and it was a really, so that they wouldn't have to move again, but it was really, really hard because it meant that the entire house aged and when new people came in, they tended to be more independent, right? And so we had to, um, we had to work really hard to create this culture of caring. It was a lot, a lot of work and um, to, to help to provide those tools so that people could you know, maintain the social connection even as the ability, their abilities change. Okay, is there any more questions? Let me look on the chat here real quick. I don't see any more in the chat box. Um, I just wanted to add real quick just because um, I've, I'm 39 and I have white hair as you can see and I've been embracing that and I've been taking advantage of all the, all the discounts that they're giving to people who are over 60 and I've been saving my money. So that's been great. <laughs> so I've enjoyed um, saving my money from getting my hair colored and hearing all sorts of comments, even from my children and my children's friends that say, why is your mom, is that your mom? I thought that was your grandma. And I say, I'm older and your, your friends or parents are older than me and I don't really care. So <laughs> I, yeah, that's an nice the, the, the stereotypes of, of, I guess, having. Right. Work. And it's a really interesting point. I mean, we don't walk around with age, you know, on our head. Right. And so we're making judgments about people's age and I could be based on these outer signals that we see, you know, these outer signs and symbols that we see. So yeah, that's a really interesting point. <laughs> So, well, I, I think if we don't have any more questions, we just, I just want to really, all of us want to thank you, uh, Dr. Mejia, for being here today and leading us through this uh, great presentation and discussion. And I want to let everyone know, stay tuned for hopefully another one of these wonderful, um, presenta another presentation next month. So thank you again, Dr. Mejia. Yeah, really thank you. It. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for this forum. And, and thank you to you guys for your excellent questions and this discussion. I really appreciate it. All um, right. Yeah. Take care. Yep, you too. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Cheers.